course we couldn't stay away from wiki Wachi. Do something cool. Joyce also took us to the Hillsborough River, where we saw dozens of alligators. We didn't see many alligators on this tour, but I feel like I just want to sway side to side and sing him a lullaby. This swamp tour was more like a ride at an amusement park, which is awesome. This swamp was fed by a natural spring, and believe it or not, you could drink out of it. What inspires you to let to take in street people, as you call it? You know, so when I guess when Tony and Jared and I first met you, we were really scrubby. We looked like we hadn't showered in months. Yeah. I had already heard a few words from Gina, and she had told me about what you were kind of on a quest to do. And of course, my husband and I have done many things like that and hitchhiked a lot of countries. Um, rather than wait for a bus, we just put our thumb out and then picked out by people from Mer Mercedes to junk cars, you know, what the back of a pickup, in fact, in Australia with a bunch of Aborigines. So I figure if they have the nerve, and I, when I see people, I, I'd heard about you guys, and it sounded exciting to me. It sounded like what I would do, would like to do. Maybe a lot of other people, too. So I was interested to hear about it, and I had an empty guest house. You mentioned you've hitchhiked. All yes, over. my husband and I, he used to hear these tales at USF of kids hitchhiking through Europe. So our first trip to Europe, we hitchhiked from Amsterdam to Zurich, Switzerland. We had our backpack sent because we were going to be mountain climbing from in Switzerland. And luckily... So would you? So your husband was a professor, yeah, a coach? Yeah, yeah, he was a coach and then he was the athletic trainer at University of South Florida. And he overheard kids I, he talking heard kids about all the time, you how know? they do this yeah. and, he, and he decided to go for it with exactly. you. Exactly. For us, you changed the course of our lives. It, it could have went any other way, but mm, meeting, meeting you, having a place to stay, changed, it made things a lot easier for us. And, and we well, were, and yes, we, but I like to think that you were going to finish your mission anyway. It might have been a little harder because you did have a little air-conditioned place to come to once in a while to cool off while you were working all that time on the sailboat. You think and it? You think it would have all worked out? I think it would have. I okay. mean, I think somehow when you go somewhere and have a, I think you would have seen it through somehow. Okay. But I like to think I was a help, and I like to think I was part of it because, it, my spirit is with you. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. Uh, maybe you can talk about, a little bit about your sailing experiences. You've had. Oh a couple. yeah, because I mean, I was to Cuba before you, and I was on a huge luxury sailboat, and I was sick all the way to Cuba. And I was upset because I've been on sailboats and I've had a sailboat, a little one, on my own lake and gone up and down by myself and windsurfers. So I felt kind of accomplished till it took off. And before we went under the Sunshine Skyway, I was, luckily I never threw up, but for three days I laid in bed and wished I just was on land. Tell us about the owner and how that the whole, owner the trip was started. Quite elderly, he had bought it brand new. Somebody else had motored up with it, not using the sails or anything, and brought it to a marina in St. Petersburg where he'd been sitting on it, I think, for a few months and enjoying the, the what do you call it? The arena, the, what do you call it? The, the marina? The marina life. Mm -hmm. Sitting on the back of his boat and very being part nice. of it. Yeah, yeah it looks so, it's a very different life. And I understand later, I did a few boats. I'm a decorator, and I realized some people really don't go far in them. <laughs> some people never leave the docks. <laughs> That's what I mean. And it's, it's, a, it's a lot right. easier. It's, so it's before pretty nice we got under the Sunshine Skyway, we had gone in a sandbar, and then they worried about the bottom of the boat, and somebody went under it and checked it. And then the first time they pulled the big sail up, um, it was tw all tangled. And, but luckily we had two other gentlemen that were very accomplished sailors. And then I think we did well. Out of 12 boats, it was kind of a race. And so out of 12 sailboats, uh, sailing ships I should say, um, we were second. 
because the the wind was I thought we were gonna die, you know, but I wasn't used to waves that big. I've just only been on big boats in Europe where they take cars and trains and everything. So oh my God, every time we went over a wave, I thought, okay, we won't come up. You know, so it was exciting. It was almost a fifty foot sailing boat. I mean, the kitchen was nicer than mine. I would say it was very luxurious. So we meet this man and lady. They had just come from the Seychelles Islands, and they had really a luxury sailboat. And they said, well, if you don't have to hurry to Switzerland to meet your college group, why don't you go with us for a week? And I thought it was a chance of a lifetime. And they were nice. We went to supper with them. And they were waiting for a part for their, their motor. So, so this morning, the next morning, we took off with them. But we had to go around the island to pick up supplies and water and, I guess, fuel for the engine. And he turned into a monster. I mean, we should have gotten off right there at the marina he pulled into to get gas. And on the first part of the voyage, I mean, he, he was just horrible. The way he talked to his wife, the language he used, he was a completely different person as the captain of the boat. And uh, so the next morning, Tony worked on an excuse that, and kept it secret from me that we had to leave the boat, which I was glad, you know. He just made up a story, said he called the campground in Switzerland and some of our students were not being the way they should be and the camp owner was going to throw them out. So when the boat sailed off and we waved goodbye to him, I thought, oh, great. And I said, so what's going on? And he said, I made that all up. <laughs> You've seen the world and, and on a budget, you know, yes. and you would yeah. travel because Tony was a teacher. Yeah. So maybe share a, a bit of like your secrets because even now your habits you can see that your habits have stuck with you your whole yep. life, and you, yep. it's, it's part of you. Yeah, we knew if we were going to not, both of us not working a couple months a year, that we had to save other ways. But, I mean, you can still be a generous person and be thrifty. Yeah. Okay. When people say we're cheap, I said, no, no, I call it thrifty. <laughs> I feel like I'm generous, but... Um, Definitely. You yeah, and you can't, be, you can't just go out and lavish meals and stuff like that, so we have to... We always had to eliminate our friends that spent too much money. That's fine for them, but we wanted to be gone for the summer. So you would always pack your own lunches oh, kind of thing? I mean, when I'm hungry food. sometimes, even when I'm driving around now, I think, oh, well, why pay 4 or $5? I can come home and have a peanut butter sandwich. It's only food. And then the people you run into when, you, when you're traveling on less money and you're in less expensive places, there's probably going to be a lot of people just like you. I mean, you can't just leave a job and come back and know you have no job, no house, no car. I mean, you just got to have other plans. So, and I think we did. And unfortunately, now my husband can't do that. So I'm glad we did. But if we could, we would still be traveling the same way. Because I have had people say, Joyce, you have enough money to go first class. My, my answer is we, we have been going first class because we've met first class people. Maybe talk about like your current situation. For me, I think the hardest thing about being you would would to have have all these memories, and you're not able to share them yeah. with the one you love the most, and he's that right is... there with you every day. Mm -hmm. I I just want to know like how you're so strong and you get through every day, and you you know, and you're able to entertain guests. Well, and... my friends, my neighbors, people like you. That remember that all helps you know because there's other people you can talk about your memories with just so when I start talking about them is when I, it's just you just wish you know I'm 82 I wish I was 22 but I'm not so I just have to do the best at 82 and you know Tony was such a good person I hate it when people don't remember him or don't know him because they wouldn't forget him so I think the nicer husband or spouse or significant other you have, the harder you will try to take care of him. Four hip operations on his left hip and he got staph infection. And everybody's pretty sure that all that sedation didn't help him along. So each time it got a little worse and, and he does have Alzheimer's, but, but he can hear and he eats good and he's healthy as heck. If it wasn't up here, we'd still be backpacking. I might even have talked him into a sailboat. I don't think so. <laughs> but he might have gotten in the kayak more often later. Actually, when we were traveling, we had a lot of people go out of their way. I mean, oh my gosh, to bring us here to see a 
some famous place in Halifax that had a big lighthouse and it was quite a way out of the way. And I mean, those people were like me and Tony, and they were thinking, look at them, they're having a good time. So they picked us up and dropped us off at a boat that we had to go back to Maine. <laughs> but we, we didn't have a car, but we, had, we were going to rent a car maybe when we got to Nova Scotia over to Halifax. And, uh, and then these people kind of gave us a ride up a hill, and then we thought, well, what the heck, you know. I think that was our first hitchhiking, was through Nova Scotia and up the Cabot Trail. And it was fun. We're here in St. Petersburg, Ozona Shores Marina, to meet Captain Rusty. Some of you may be wondering how the bums learned to sail. And for us, it was all about networking. The boat we'll be sailing on today is a Corsair 24. My first time with Rusty and on his boat. The outrigger holes on this boat can fold up to give you a mono hull or fold down, and now it's a trimaran. His uh, mainsail is wrapped around his boom. Rusty's going to tell us a little bit about this electric outboard that gets him in and out of harbors. It's the um, 1003 by Torquedo, um, and it is incredible. The batteries float. They're totally waterproof. The entire um, unit is uh, waterproof, and um, you don't want to test it a lot, but <laughs> um, it's uh, proven to be much better than their earlier versions. And the um, system for a relatively small boat like this Corsair 24 works out really well. And um, um, because we're sailors, all we do is work in and out of a marina and need some source. It's not an inexpensive unit. Uh, for example, batteries uh, new, if you're getting a new one, are $695 a piece. And, you know, we've got a couple of them. Uh, because you don't get a lot of time. You get at a moderate speed, um, you're getting about uh, 30 minutes of drive time. Now they have uh, all sorts of assemblies, such if you want to uh, have a uh, charger unit, such as solar, they have those kinds of things. I have no idea how quick they are <laughs> in recharging. Um, and just a battery takes about 18 hours on 110 voltage to charge. So it's not the sort of thing that if you're needing uh, a lot of uh, source power that you're going to get it there. They also make battery um, packs that will sit, you know, in an area outside uh, in your hull. And those things, I don't know, you can get a uh, fair amount of power off those for an extended run and then you're not using this battery. And what would that unit run you about brand new? I suspect you're talking um, uh, $2,500 for the a whole unit with one battery. My guess, I, it's easy to check. It's mm -hmm. Torquedo. Uh, no hard feelings, Rusty, but I heard after we left you guys talked about who might be dropping off the sailing, who might be the weak link, and I was the one that you decided yeah. on. <laughs> Have, yeah. I was hoping you could yeah. you could maybe give us some of your thoughts, that, like, you know, what was your thinking there? Because I'm sure you actually had some good points. Why was I the weak link in, of the three? I think my general sense was that I didn't think you were quite as on board about this whole thing and then with your experience of getting sick in your passage to Cuba that that really uh, weakened that uh, that commitment to sailing and so on and uh, I've never experienced um, seasickness but I understand it's just wicked and uh, you know if you're not comfortable in those kinds of situations I was afraid that was playing into it 
As is the custom, we sailed to Three Rutgers Island, and Rusty left his mane up while we were at anchor. The tribe, what we do is we are releasing the uh, one line, and this line then takes the board down for the centerboard. And I just want a little centerboard right now. I actually can go down to about a depth of um, five and a half feet with the boat, or with it all the way up, it's about 14 inches, 12 inches of, of uh, draft. Let that sail pop, because we don't want it to lock up at all right now. Too cool, guys. Oh, the boat ashore. Alleluia. These are the tales of Boab.